Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can get access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. My guest today is Brianna Joy Gray. Brianna was the national press secretary for Bernie Sanders in his 2020 campaign, and before that she wrote extensively for The Intercept, as well as many other outlets like Rolling Stone magazine, Current Affairs, New York magazine, and The Guardian. She currently hosts the Bad Faith podcast, which I hope to go on soon. We talk about how Brianna's international childhood influenced her worldview. We talk about American exceptionalism and patriotism and whether they're justified. We talk about how identity politics crowds out the issues of poverty and class. We talk about the effects of crime in poor neighborhoods. We discuss the cancellation of Whoopi Goldberg. We argue about the extent to which culture is a cause of racial and ethnic disparities. We talk about our cultural obsession with four-year colleges and the prospect of instead supporting vocational schools much more than we currently do. And finally, we discuss minimum wage laws and socialism generally. I really enjoyed this one, and I hope you do too. So without further ado, Brianna Joy Gray. All right, Brianna Joy Gray, thanks so much for coming on my show. It's my pleasure, Coleman. So I assume some of my audience will definitely be aware of you from the Bad Faith podcast where you've been, you know, interviewing the likes of Noam Chomsky and holding people's feet to the fire, having very interesting conversations. You had Glenn Lowry on um, maybe nine months ago, who I know I have a lot of over- overlap with his audience. Um, my vantage point on you initially was I, I encountered you maybe four or five years ago. And I think, I think at that point you were writing for the Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone magazine. I was freelancing. We were freelancing. So my whole, my whole, I don't know, media career, if you want to call it that, didn't it begin until maybe, uh, summer of 2017, at which point mm. I started writing freelancing and wrote some for Rolling Stone around that time. Yeah. I remember you had, you had a piece, you know, criticizing, identity politics from the point of view of, of taking the focus off of class issues Mm. that I thought was, um, interesting and and compelling angle. Uh, and, and then later, I don't know how much later we were both on our mutual friend Zed Jelani's podcast where he was hosting mini debates between people. And I remember we, we clashed over some topics Mm. relating to crime and, and other things. I don't, fully remember. And then, and then you, you became the national press secretary for none other than Bernie Sanders. And, um, and since then you've had the, the bad faith podcast and I've seen some of your clips there. So that's, that's basically been my vantage point on you these past couple of years, but I actually know very little about your background and how you came to be the person you are, care about the issues you do. So if you, if you can just for a little bit, give me some details of your biography. How did you become who, who you are? How did I become who I am? Well, I don't know. Uh, that's a big question. I was born in Washington, D.C. Um, my parents went to Howard, went to school here. Oh, my, my dad went to Howard, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. How old about is your dad? So my dad was born in 64. He would okay. have been in Howard in, in the mid 80s. Okay. They're a little younger than my parents. My yeah. father was born in 58. Uh, but uh, we didn't live here long and neither of my parents were from here. Uh, we moved to North Carolina when I was two. My mom was doing her PhD program there in psychology. And my father was a research chemist. Um, they very quickly realized that the rat race was not going to be one that they could win. My mom looked around in her department and saw the salaries that people were earning as academics and realized that it wasn't going to be sustainable for her. My brother was getting, um, you know, kind of marginalized in the public school system we were in and they couldn't afford a private school or any kind of alternatives. So my mom, being a, a rather resourceful woman, uh, went to an international school 
fair, job fair in Miami and realized that she could get a job working as a teacher in the international school circuit. My father became certified as a science teacher. She was a school psychologist. And so we moved abroad for eight years, uh, Saudi Arabia first for two years and Kenya for six. Wow. We're coming back in, to the States in 2001 to New York, where I graduated from high school and the international school there and off to college and law school. Um, I went to law school largely because I, like a lot of people who graduated from college, wasn't entirely sure what they wanted to do, but mm. was told, oh, you're good at talking and writing, so that'll be good. But the promise of litigation that you're sold on shows like Suits has no bearing on reality. You're nowhere near a courtroom. There's no kind of rhetorical skills that get mm -hmm. um, exploited or, or used in any useful way. And, of course, I also graduated uh in the middle of the recession, right at the beginning of the recession in 2007. And the legal market was very much not what it used to be by the time I graduated from law school. So, you know, I felt listless, like many kind of elder millennials like myself who got stuck uh, between economic crises, as it were. Mm. And when Bernie came along, he activated, I think, a lot of the ideals that I was raised with. My mother came from a rather kind of unorthodox somewhat progressive household. My grandfather was in the nation of Islam. And she, she jokes that when she went to Howard, she had already read all of the books on her reading list because her father had made her read all of those things as a middle school student. Um, mm. And she was always rather vocal, although not dogmatic about expressing her frustrations with the limitations of the democratic party um, and the corporatized nature, nature of our two party system. And so I think when someone like Bernie Sanders came along, my mother was a longtime fan. I wasn't really politically involved or aware to be truthful. But for me, like for many people, he activated a sense that, oh, things could be better. And here's a blueprint for all of the ways in which our system could be working more efficiently if it weren't so captured by corporate entities. And if we actually had candidates that weren't taking all of this money from the very interest groups that are misaligned with the interests of the people that they're supposed to be advocating for. So it was a natural fit. Um, and I became very frustrated in the context of 2016 about the absence of coverage um, of Bernie, generally speaking, but also this line that said black people in particular weren't interested in Bernie, black people and yeah. women weren't interested in Bernie. And that's when I started uh, my own podcast, Someone's Wrong on the Internet, and then started writing, in fact, to bring attention to that podcast. And it was the journalism career that took off. And as you pointed out, one of my first early viral articles was about um, identity politics being weaponized by liberals in order to cover for the extent to which they're not actually delivering for the working people that they say they're delivering for, for, from. They, trans, they, they transform that group, which is largely diverse right into sing they, they erase the kind of class dynamics of that group, cast them entirely in kind of diversity terms, uh, appeal to and support kind of superficial diversity measures that ignore the ways that their ma marginalized ethnic, religious, or gender status manifest in material terms. And therefore is able to do this sidestep where they can pretend to be serving the interest of those groups while actually delivering nothing in a way that would hurt their own personal bottom line. So then we were off to the races. Yeah. So that, that line has always been really compelling to me. Um, but before we go down that rabbit hole, I just want to ask, I, I didn't realize that you had spent a, a good portion of your childhood in Saudi Arabia and Kenya. Mm. And I'm curious if, you know, what about that, if anything, do you think informed the ideas that would compel you uh, when you were an adult, when you became an adult? Um, people ask me that. And there's a part of me that thinks, well, I was in the, in the third and fourth grade in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia, you know, fifth through 10 in Kenya. And, you know, I, I sometimes used to think, oh, people expect me to have an answer that is not realistic given my youth in kind right. of, you know, just being a kid, being a kid. Mm -hmm. But as I've gotten older, I do think that there's a way that having those experiences make the, makes the world seem smaller, makes other people's problems seem less attenuated from your own, makes you feel more like you're a part of a global community and less susceptible to the idea of American exceptionalism. Mm. Uh, and those are values that I think many people on the left hold. But I also think that I 
was more receptive to some left arguments because I was more receptive to the idea that other people elsewhere in the world do things differently. And every single time something is different from America doesn't mean America is is doing it better. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And really seeing the world more as a test kitchen outside of a kind of blinkered American uh, view of its own superiority in every single respect. Um, And I've also, you know, What's funny is that I'm like, I think some, perhaps some other leftists, I spent most of my childhood kind of defending America. Mm. No, we have this, you know, when you go to an international school, everybody's from everywhere. Everyone's joking about everybody else's country. There's this kind of like, I don't know, a kind of gamesmanship about it all. And, you know, not in a jingoistic way, but in a kind of, yeah, like you, you like where you're from and mm. there's a certain comfort in having culture familiarity and being able to sit both with the idea that you can, there's positive things about America and there are things that should be improved and we should be aiming for a more perfect union without necessarily falling into this trap of saying that, you know, um, there's no room for any sense of patriotic solidarity on the left and that we could be redefining patriotism to really be talking about the things we should be proud of in this country and not just, you know, military intervention or um, kind of a superficial kind of, uh, jingoism that leads us into some of the country's worst impulses and our leadership's worst impulses instead of the things that I really do think are, should be examples for people more broadly. Yeah. So it's interesting. I, I think people sometimes assume that I'm a really worldly, really well-traveled cosmopolitan person. And in, in some ways I am, but in another way i I've always lived in the same 20 mile radius my entire life, which is, you know, Northern New Jersey and New York. Mm. Um, And, and uh, you know, I think the, the element of my upbringing that I, it's funny how sometimes the arguments you make, you're implicitly arguing against something that you hold to be sort of out there and pernicious and wrong and the points you emphasize are often a function of what you what you're reacting against. So, you know, one thing is, is my mother was a Marxist. So when I was, you know, five years old, I knew the name Karl Marx, Emil Durkheim, even like she had no sense of not talking about her Marxism PhD to her five year old. So I knew all of those names and the basic concepts. And, um, you know, I think as I got older and and met more people from the around around the world, and and traveled a little bit, my my basic understanding was that people all around the world, including black and brown people, want to come to America more often uh, than almost anywhere else. Which is to say, like if you polled the world's migrants that want to leave their birth country about where they want to go. The, the answer you get more than any other is usually America. No, come on. I'm, so, not, I'm not true. I'm not sure that's true. I'm not, I'm not sure that gels with my experiences either, but go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Well, yeah. So, I mean, it, interestingly, I, I found, you know, I, I was never compelled as a kid by this like rah, rah American patriotism kind of thing. I, I, I always saw that as pure tribalism. Mm. Um, but, you know, as I've grown, grown older, I think I, I've grown into, you know, there, there must be something, you know, it, it's a comparative point, right? It's like to compare America to a utopia, you're going to find it, um, you're going to find it lacking in a, a billion different ways. And even in specific ways, like our, our health, our disastrous healthcare system, you're going to find it lacking relative to a lot of our peer countries. Um, but like on the whole, there has to be something that the world's migrants see here in terms of economic opportunity or, or else they're just crazy. There's so many people banging on the doors well, to want to get in on, so on whatever are, we're doing. There are here. a lot of people banging on the doors to get into a lot of other countries. You said if you compare America to a utopia, I think that's letting America off the hook. Migrants are making the decision comparing America to very real countries that exist today that are not utopias, but are a, good deal better than what America has on offer for immigrants. So, you know, Scandinavian countries, Canada, the UK, I, I have a friend, for instance, I'm thinking of 
whose family is Caribbean and who has members of the diaspora of their family, some of whom migrated to um, Canada, some of whom ended up in London. And he ended up here in the United States for school. And there was a constant comparative analysis of what they were each getting, their bang for their buck. And his family members were all united in their horror of what his situation was like in terms of his ability to afford healthcare in this country, for instance. I have another, a, a guy I dated actually, who family were Chinese immigrants and some of his family members ended up in France and obviously his family ended up, you know, in the Bronx in the comparison between how their families ended up in that immigration, um, you know, shakeout also inured to the benefit of the family that ended up in France. Right. So I think that some of the, you know, interest in, in immigrating to America has to do with, um, us being a larger country that takes in more immigrants than some others just, you know, person per person. And in the grand scheme of things, no one would deny that there are amazing opportunities here as compared to certain other places. But that comparative exercise, I think, sometimes obscures the extent to which America being the wealthiest country in the history of the world, as Bernie Sanders sometimes used to like to say, could be doing so much more than it is. And sometimes by keeping the conversation of at we're better than other places, we are underselling our ability to make America as good as it could be for the people who live here and who, in fact, are what makes it, uh, you know, gives it all the potential to be so great. Mm. Yeah. So let, let's backtrack to this point you were making earlier, the point that you initially started writing uh, about, you know, this sort of class versus race issue. Um, you're someone that has been you know, re- really on the forefront, I would argue, at least from my vantage point, in terms of arguing that identity politics obscures the extent to which there is a huge class divide in this country, um, makes it more difficult to create a multiracial coalition of poor people and people who care about poverty, who care about wealth inequality. And this was really the, the drum that Bernie has been banging for a long time, And interestingly, he has had a surprising degree of overlap with some Trump supporters, you know, like the, the, you, you'll so often find Trump supporters that will say, I hate Hillary. She's a crook, but I actually could see myself voting for Bernie, which was always interesting given just how different they are in many ways. But this is, this is a point that's, is, has always been compelling to me. So I'll give one example of, of something that I found really disturbing that almost nobody talked about during the, the year of during the year of George Floyd's killing and the subsequent protests and riots, there was a huge push to get, uh, to divert, to to diversify boards in, in order, in other words, to get black millionaires on the seats on the boards of publicly traded companies so they could become wealthier. And this was justified as a direct response to the death of a black dude from the hood who died under the knee of a police officer from a totally different reality uh, as the great majority of, of the black millionaires that are now you know, being thrust on, on board seats as if that action rectifies or has almost anything to do with the problems and the trials and tribulations of someone like George Floyd and people who grow up in those communities. Right. Yeah. And this was never called like greed or avarice. It was, it was presented as justice as this is somehow social justice, not so like, to me, this was an example of your point that this notion of racial solidarity or racial oneness or identity politics can really obscure, um, massive inequalities that we, we remedy in these cheap ways that actually do very little for, for people that are truly disadvantaged. Yeah. So I would tweak that just a little bit by saying, I want to be really clear about the fact of identity politics, which all politics is identity politics, whether you're saying your identity is as a West Virginia, Virginian or, or a New Jersey in Um, And you have politics that are related to the state that you're from, whether the fact of your being a man or a woman, you know, gay or straight, trans 
what have you, affects your politics or what you fight for, whether you're rich or poor, your class identity is part of your identity, whether you're an immigrant or native born is part of your identity, whether you're tall or short. I mean, every single thing about who you are as a human being is a kind of identity politics and Republican or Democrat, you know, from the history of politics, there have always been identities, religious identities, et cetera, that have informed one's perspective and has pushed people into kind of groups one way or another. My concern is the extent to which identity, oftentimes in the context I'm describing, racial identity is being weaponized. So my critique is not of identity politics as a phenomenon. It's just a phenomenon. It's a, a neutral reality. And I want, to, I want to be clear about this because sometimes people say identity politics is a problem because they don't want people to be advocating for shared interests by identity members, right? So obviously, if, if you live in a building, let's say, with an um, exploitative landlord who is not giving you hot water, and you rally together with all the other residents of 52 Huffington Street to get your rights— if I come along and say it's illegitimate for you guys to band together because the identity of 52 Huffington Street Streetians is, is identity politics and wrong, that's obviously silly, right? The whole point is that you have a shared fight that you're fighting for together. And that can be true of racial groups or people who live in a state or a community and all other kinds of things. And there's nothing wrong with advocating on the basis of your shared marginalization. The problem is, especially when it comes to race in this country, oftentimes... And what people are saying they're fighting for a shared identity group, but to your example, they're actually sharing for a very narrow band, fighting for a very narrow band of class interest. So there is this presumption that all black people share the same class interest and therefore the interest of one black person is necessarily the interest of another. And that enables folks to weaponize, to weaponize the idea of identity politics against the interest of the majority of the group that they are purporting to fight for. And that's what's so pernicious about it. It's the weaponized identity politics where they can say, we're going to get more black people on corporate boards as a means to address the miscarriage of justice that was George Floyd's Floyd's murder. Or we're going to um, elect Barack Obama, and that's going to be a stand-in for addressing some of the systemic concerns that are experienced disproportionately by black people. And also by so many other people who I think are left out of a coalition because often it is framed exclusively in identity terms. And this is something that our mutual friends at Jelani, I think, is very right to point out, that there is a way that sometimes liberal movements can, you know, cut off, cut off their nose to despite their face because there are people who might be members of their coalition um, who are not included as part of the conversation because it's understood solely, exclusively in racial terms instead of as racial and class terms simultaneously, which is, is very easy to do. And, and Zed, the particular example I'm thinking of is his analysis that showed that um, some huge percent, like 95%, I forget the exact number, don't, don't quote me on that, but of all police shootings happen in neighborhoods mm-hmm. where the average income is under $100,000 a year. Right. Uh, and, and zero happened when it's over $200,000 a year. And so we're really talking about a class issue here that's being obscured, in addition yeah. to there obviously being racial bias as a component of it. So I, I think I like the way you, f- how you framed it helps me understand your point of view that you're not against identity politics as such, but you're against the weaponization of identity right. politics. And I think where I differ from you, I, th- I believe, is that I think racial identity politics in practice almost always gets weaponized because... So, like, to take your example of, of you know, the, the 52nd Street, uh, Huffington Street people. <laughs> yeah. That group is, it's picking out a group of people that are actually all experiencing the same grievance. Mm. So it makes perfect sense for them to organize around it. Their, their landlord is terrorizing all of them, right? Race, like, like there's almost, at this point in American society, there, there's very rarely a grievance that picks out black people as a category cleanly. Right. It's like, uh, uh, you know, the so many of the things that we're actually talking about when we think we're talking about race, like the example you gave, are are pegged much more closely to poverty, um, sometimes even more to intergenerational poverty. 
um, intergenerational poverty and crime, the problems of what ha- used to be called the underclass or the ghetto. And, uh, and so I don't think it's a um, sort of a, a unique exception or a particularly egregious example of the, you know, people pushing to get on boards as if that has something to do with what George Floyd, George Floyd's, what George Floyd went through. I think that is an inevitable consequence of a society where we allow, I don't mean legally, but where we promote culturally identity politics because it's just, it creates a never ending incentive for people that are actually quite privileged to claim the skin color connection and, and therefore to organize on those terms. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's an interesting question whether or not, organizing around racial identity, it has diminishing returns in a country where the mechanisms to weaponize identity, white racial identity are so efficient and complete, but it is also not exclusively a concern for black people. So I would argue, for example, that historically in the recent history, at least Republicans have done an amazing job of doing a similar dance with working class whites, where if you were to ask you know, the, the biggest turnaround of the 20th century was this mobile, this shift from working class white voters identifying with Democrats because of their commitment to labor issues to both corporate parties, basically abandoning labor issues and it becoming this kind of like who can, who can speak the lingua, lingua franca of labor issues the same way with black people, you have who can say the right thing, the woke thing on TV without ever trying to commit in any meaningful way. So now you had, once everyone threw labor under the bus, it became the Republicans who did a better job of speaking to the white working class voter than the Democratic voter. And the Democratic voter said, okay, we're going to pivot and do minorities and do this identity politics speak, both of which are very superficial, right? Democrats don't do anything for black people. <laughs> Bill Clinton cuts the social safety net, uh, enacts play, the crime plays bill. plays saxophone, but he plays, plays saxophone, saxophone, right? So okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. He, he says to soldiers, he opens his campaign at the act, execution of a, of, of a mentally, um, of, a, of a low IQ black prisoner. All of these things to signal that he absolutely isn't going to help black people, but it doesn't matter because what's the alternative? It's a Republican party who's gone all in on saying, well, the rest of the country is mine. And, you know, wearing a hard hat and American and flag pin, but also um, supporting all of these trade policies that sent that both parties did, by the way, we had two corporate parties who were supporting these trade policies to send all these jobs overseas con- contributed to industrial decline, um, all the job loss in the Midwest and all of the fallout um, that we had to deal with. Uh, in terms of the deregulatory landscape in 2008, which still, you know, has had this lingering effect, which no one wants to talk about, but, you know, like 30% of the pensions of a huge portion of the population was gone and it was 40% for black Americans, right? So uh, of their collective value was gone in 2008, not never to recover. So what we do have is Uh, performances across the board. I I don't disagree with you. And I think it's an interesting question. How much should we credit the utility of identity politics in 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 this kind of public sphere when it is being so corrupted? But this is a bigger question than kind of racial identity politics. And that is, I think, what a lot of the left is wrestling with. Not not, um, liberals, by the way. I want to be really clear that when I refer to liberals, I'm not referring to anything that I identify with. I'm thinking of corporate Democrats, mainstream Democrats who very much trade almost exclusively in this kind of weaponized identity rhetoric. When I talk about the left, I mean a more economic populist part of the country that identified with the Bernie Sanders movement and who has been for a long time very critical about the cynical weaponization of identity in part because we saw how it was used to elevate Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders in 2016. I think that was a real eye-opening moment for people. But it's also a question that I think conservatives are going to have to start grappling with. And I think they are with some interlocutors like Tucker Carlson, who, whether you think it's in good faith or bad, has been raising some of these class issues and has been willing to talk about things like um, uh, senators being able to do insider trading and mm-hmm. having a critique of that, that you'll ha- you'll, you're, you're, you'll find it difficult to see on MSNBC, for instance, or, you know, talking about NAFTA and some of these trade policies, which Donald Trump talked about and liberals refused to kind of acknowledge had real resonance with people separate and apart from any of the other kind of rhetoric that he was using that was more nativist or, 
you know, uh, bigoted or whatever, however you want to describe it. And that to me is, is, is a big question. Is there going to be an insurgent left that is able to capture a lot of the populist energy in the country that is well-founded and well-grounded and legitimate because of the way that our institutions, our media institutions and our political institutions have divested themselves from substantive economic policy, politics and is just fighting us back and forth with each other over CRT and don't say gay and you're racist and woke? Or is it going to be the right that manages to put forward a, a populist person who gets all of that populist energy, but I would argue is not going to funnel it meaningfully in good faith toward economic programs that are actually going to help people. It's going to just continue to um, lead to a winner's take all um, state of rugged individualism where the rich continue to exert the advantage they already have to use the systems that are in place and which are already deeply uh, inequitable to continue to squeeze the working classes as they've been doing for the last, you know, 30, 40 years of neoliberalism. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think a lot of this for me comes down to race is not a good proxy for disadvantage anymore. Income is a decent proxy. It's a, it's a better proxy, right? Like you, you, if you, if you're trying to, you know, I grew up as, as a black kid in a, in a wealthy, diverse suburb, the notion that because we have so many people have this race first view of what, what it means to be disadvantaged. You know, like I've, I've, I know white people that grew up with, with meth head parents that I would be prioritized over in, in countless different domains uh, throughout the country. And I've, I think it's, you know, it's just a, a fundamental belief of mine that, that income and class is, is a much better proxy for disadvantage than, than race is. And that doesn't necessarily tell us what we should do, what works in order to curb disadvantage. And, uh, I tend to, you know, get off, get off the train sometimes at, um, gestures towards any kind of capital S socialism. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm persuadable on a sort of an issue by issue basis. Well, Coleman, what does your mom have to say about that? Do you guys still talk about these issues? <laughs> well, no, when, when she was alive, we didn't really talk about I'm it, but, but she, she passed away years ago, but mm-hmm. she would be, I mean, she would love you. She would, she would be all <laughs> over you. She would be like, <laughs> listen to Brianna. <laughs> she is right. Well, Professor um, Lowry's wife is also a Bernie supporter. I think these, right. these kind of relationships are so interesting to me, especially, especially between black people, I have to say, because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm so happy to talk to you and I was so happy to talk to Glenn. I think he's wonderful, mm-hmm. but I think part of, part of our, the reason our dynamic was so easy is because I'm not saying you have to be black to be talking in good faith as a conservative or, or however, I don't mean to put words in your mouth or I identify you in a way that you don't identify, but there is sometimes, I think a relationship between that and I think your ability to make or your willingness to make kind of good faith arguments. So while I you know, continue to disagree with Professor Lowry about any number of things, I don't believe that he is being driven by a desire to justify, let's say, a worldview that is, uh, as a first principle, wanting to collapse a social safety net and therefore arguing about black inferiority as a reason why we don't need to keep pouring money into the black community, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, an, if it's an innate difference, this is, this is the, cause this is the take, this is really what I think is driving some other people that aren't professor Larry, mm-hmm. you know, that the take is if black people are at a disadvantage and disparities are caused by something intrinsic or cultural or genetic or what have you, then there's no point in raising funding or increasing funding in order to try to close disparities. We shouldn't be involved in the work of closing disparities. This is just the natural order of things. And I guess we can just keep, I don't know, spending money on the military or whatever, whatever else. And my first principle argument is different than that, right? My first principle argument is that I almost don't care about measuring people's skull sizes. I mean, we can have a conversation about it, but it's irrelevant to me because my ethical project Um, my ideological project, which I'll be very open about is that I think that there's an intrinsic value in human beings and that there should be a baseline living standard for everybody, because what does it mean for us as a society? What does it mean for me as a member of a society in the, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world to blithely be stepping over homeless people as on my way to, on my way to whole greens, 
even if I don't care about that other person and their intrinsic merit as a human being, what does that say to me as a participant in society? What does it say about the children that are being raised around me and who I'm setting an example for? Um, and so why am I going down this road? I think it's important to care about people's first principles and their ideological projects and believing that kind of Professor Lowry or yourself are coming from a place that is not that okay, um, that kind of bad faith approach that some other people have is very useful. And I think that the fact that we are coming from black people, even if we disagree about um, what's causing things or what should be done or, or things like that, there is a certain comfort level, I think, in, in hoping and, you know, understanding each other that we're, we're, we are operating in good faith, even if we are going in different directions. Right. Yeah. The, I, I hit on a way of formulating it when I was on Joe Rogan recently that I, Mm. that I now remembering, I kind of liked, which is we were talking specifically about, about the problem of high murder rates, especially in black communities, what, what it does to neighborhoods. Mm. Um, and basically the status quo I feel we're at right now is that the right will talk about this issue. Tucker Mm. Carlson will talk about this issue, but you never get the sense that he's talking about it as anything other than a cudgel to wield against the left Mm. and say, look at Democrats fucking up these cities. And it's just a partisan hit point for him, right? Mm. You never get the sense that he is motivated to talk about that subject by um, a genuine ethical concern. Compassion for people who are dying and yeah. And again, it is, I think it's possible that I'm, I'm slandering him, but this is the impression that I get. You know. Well, it's not just an impression, right? Because if you, if you, you were talking about it because you wanted better outcomes, then it would be a longer conversation, a more substantive conversation about how to get those better outcomes. And I agree with you. I think liberals need to talk more about that. I think the left talks about it a great deal more than liberals, but I think liberals need to talk more about it because by leaving that void, they do give cannon fodder to someone like Tucker Carlson, who was talking about it in bad faith. And in fact, there are good answers for that. So I think that some liberals, they do have this kind of performative virtue signaling um, relationship to some of these subjects where, because they are, their reasoning from the first principle, a lot of these white liberals, their reasoning from their first principle is racism is bad. I know racism is bad and I don't really understand anything else. Cause I'm kind of a vapid and MSNBC host, but I know that racism is bad. So if Tucker Carlson says something that quote makes people look bad, I'm going to reject it out of hand instead of saying, okay, there are, there, there is violence in, in low income communities. There are high murder rates among these populations. And if I care as a good liberal about this, I should talk about ways to address it. Now, by not doing that, they allow other factions to get away with an argument that the, the way to resolve these issues is to increase funding to police departments. Now, if you showed me evidence that poli- by increasing funding to police departments meant that fewer black people were dead in the street, people would have a hard time arguing with that. But the, what the whole argument behind, you know, defund the police is that after years and years and years of throwing millions and billions of dollars at police departments, I think LA, 50% of the city's budget at this point is for the police. There is no correlation over a 30, 40 year trajectory between the size of police budgets and the rate of violent crime. And so we have to have, start having a different conversation about how you do bring down crime and what role does poverty play in all of this and what role does these concentrated um, urban developments play in this? And is there a way that we can work with architects and city engineers to help bring down the rate of crime? And because Tucker Carlson isn't talking about that and those solutions, that's what I think can lead you to a reasonable conclusion that he's not engaging in those topics in good faith. At the same time that we can have a criticism of liberals for not engaging in the topic at all because they don't really know how to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. And then there's, I guess the, the second half of it, the problem is that if you do try to talk about this uh, on the left or, or as a liberal, I think you become open to accusations from ra- of racism or uh, Uncle Tomism if you're black. Yeah. And and um, I mean, w- what you were saying before about the fact that you can you can talk to me and Glenn and and feel and and be reasonably sure that we're coming from a good angle that that makes sense to me intuitively. At the same time, what happens if you are a white person that really cares about this issue for the right reasons? It's like you're under a cloud of suspicion from the start. 
you, you don't have the melanin force field, as my friend <laughs> Camille Foster would say. And, and, and so it might seem wise to just wipe your hands of the issue altogether and say, I'm not even going to, even though it's something I really care about, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to talk about it because... And people make the decision, but look, I think it's a rebuttable pr- presumption. I don't presume that every black person is necessarily operating in good faith. And for the example about Tucker Carlson, I don't think, as I explained, I don't think he's operating a bad faith because he's white. I think he's operating a bad faith because he's picking and choosing arguments that don't really bear any relationship to positive outcomes for people in the community that he's kind of hand wringing about. Right. Mm-hmm. And look, I, I've been here. I'm, I'm black and a woman, but I'm certainly not a lot of other things. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not... I'm queer. I'm not, I don't live with a disability. I, you know, I'm not elderly. I'm not poor. There are a lot of things, a lot of axes of, you know, whatever you want to call it, privilege or what, what have you that I am not on. And that I talk about in the context of my career. And from time to time, people get very upset with me about things and they, mm-hmm. you know, would like, <laughs> I'm sure some people to be able to cancel me or write me off for various things. And I talk about this on the show a lot. I I make decisions sometimes, editorial decisions not to go there. And other times I decide to go there because even though I know that I don't have the, um, what did, what did you call it? The veil of, um, the the melanin force field, the the melanin force field or the LGBTQ force field, or the, I I recently, I've gotten into some trouble over conversations that I've been having about Willie Goldberg and Judaism and racial identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have a Jewish force field. I don't have a lot of different kinds of things. I'll still be willing to do it and have the conversations. Um, Cause I think they're worthwhile and I think I have something to contribute. And if it turns out I'm wrong and people want to push back, I think that's the whole point. I'm, I'm glad to have that conversation. But so, and, so now I'm curious, what was your yeah. take on Whoopi Goldberg that got you into trouble? It, it didn't get me into trouble meaningfully with anybody who matters and cares, but <laughs> you know, I had, I had Thomas Shatterson Williams and Vatya Unger Sargon on the podcast because I'd recently had this amazing conversation with um, Thomas uh, last fall about his book, you know, about being an ex black man and whether or not, you know, the pros and cons of continuing to identify racially with a one drop rule, given that it's a legacy of slave masters. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of led to this, you know, this line of thinking and questioning after having two kids uh, as a, as a mixed race man himself with a white woman who who came out looking just physiognomically very white. Right. And the kind of the absurdity of saying like these kids are, should identify as black based on this rule that was intended to keep the offspring of, you know, raped slaves and slave masters under the property ownership of, of slaves. And it's like, well, why, why are we invested in this? And we had this conversation about, well, you know, culture identity is great. And, you know, the kids should be able to identify as culturally black if they want to. And there's so much richness and wonder to be had there. But is there also like this inability to have this liminal state and can't you be both? And it it was interesting. We pushed and pulled and, you know, Mm -hmm. but when Whoopi said what she said, you know, and kind of questioned, you know, the Holocaust isn't about race, she said, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the pushback, uh, a lot of the feedback was, well, Jews aren't white. Jews aren't white was the, was the line. And while of course the argument that is correct and why would be was wrong was that Nazis conception of Jews was very much that they weren't right, white, that they were another race and that that made them targets for some of the cruelest, um, you know, genocide that we've seen in the history of humanity. Mm-hmm. At the same time today, very few people would make an argument that like Barbara Streisand isn't white. You know, that Jared Kushner isn't white. And it was really interesting to me to say that, you know, what, what is that slippage there? What is this conversation where it seems like in America to be subjugated, to have status as a marginalized group, race is the best way to get that status. So there is this investment in saying, well, Whoopi is wrong because of course Jews aren't white. When you could see a different approach, you can imagine a different kind of world where kind of religious persecution or some other kinds of identity had the same kind of power. And you saw a kind of thick, a more, a more nuanced argument. You know, some Jews are white, some Jews aren't, but they were perceived or sometimes are continued to be perceived depending on some combination of immigrant status and, you know, how they look and whether they have an accent, all these other kinds of things. Like race is this weird thing that we all are struggling to define. But the uniformity of the response in that moment, which was absolutely Jews aren't white, when 
Jewish, you know, it's an ethnicity and it's a religion and it has always existed in this kind of liminal space. You know, that conversation wasn't being had at the time. And given what I just talked about with um, Thomas about the kind of political value of racial identity in America at this moment, I thought it was really interesting to get them together and kind of talk through what it meant to identify racially as opposed to ethnically, as opposed to religiously in a contemporary context, not just having this conversation about what was obviously the perception of Nazis in you know, 1930s Germany. It seemed to me why Whoopi's comments struck a nerve and this was rarely acknowledged because people were having this surface level conversation about history and whether Jews are a race or an ethnicity, whether they're white, et cetera. But beneath that, and I think motivating all of the outrage and excitement was this unacknowledged intersectionality framework where black people are obviously considered an oppressed class in this framework. White people are considered an oppressor class and Jews are, they don't fit into the framework so neatly, right? There, right. there is, there is an argument over, okay, are Jews oppressed because of, you know, the, the pogroms everywhere in Europe and the genocide in Germany and all other, and even, you know, you know, being kept out of Ivy league schools for a long time in America, right. this whole history of oppression. So do they belong with black people in the intersectional framework or since they are uh, such a successful, economically successful minority in America relative to their numbers, right? Like the average Jewish income is, is higher than the, the, you know, average American income and so forth. Are they therefore part of the oppressor class? And, and I think that, I think many Jews wrestle with that because it's like you're, you know, I've, I've seen examples of this at Columbia. It's like you're a Jewish student in the, the like sort of critical race class at, at, a, at, a, at school and you try to say something from the Jewish perspective, empathizing with the black struggle. And it's like, do you get shut down hmm. or do you get, or is that accepted? Hmm. And there's status involved. There's a huge amount of status involved yes. in these subcultures where you don't want to be the oppressor. You want to be the oppressed in this local subculture. And I think it's possible that was motivating some of the reaction hundred percent comments. I think you put hit the nail on the head, but that's spicy for some folks, Coleman. Like some people are not, you know, I wanted to have a, you know, my, my version of having the insulation, the, the black shield. Sorry, I keep forgetting. The melanin force. The field. melanin force. Field. <laughs> it's, it's Camille's foster. Camille Foster's. <laughs> um, is, was having, you know, a Jewish interlocutor on the panel. Mm -hmm. you know, and asking her the questions and kind of getting to see what her thoughts and feelings were instead of offering something on my own. And, you know, that's a kind of protection that I felt almost necessary to have that conversation and the follow-up conversation I had on my call-in show later that day where I had, you know, Katie Halbert come on with me and continue the conversation. One, to have that, you know, force field, but also because I'm genuinely interested in their perspectives that are obviously more informed than my own um, when it comes to how Jews see themselves, <laughs> you know, obviously I, I want that perspective. Um, but it is, it is, I think that, that there are several things that you hit on that I will acknowledge are not always admitted to as issues among liberals or leftists, which is the idea that there are, there is a such thing as a narrow um, cultural space that despite broadly not having privilege or traction or he hegemony in, in the country in narrower cultural encla enclaves, there are these different power dynamics where it is, it, there is status to be had by belonging to marginalized groups. And there is a way that the privilege discourse gets weaponized into a hierarchy of oppression that leads people to, instead of having a conversation about why we should care about the interests of Jewish people instead becomes a, a battle about, well, are Jews white or not? Because the outcome of that decision militates how much we should care about Jews. Well, mm. w <laughs> we can have the conversation, but regardless, your investment in the well-being of a historically marginalized community should be on the basis of their intrinsic value, not whether or not they can fit into one of these categories that has more clout or not. And that was kind of the root I was trying to get to in this conversation, which I thought was an interesting intellectual enterprise, but some people on you know Twitter feel differently. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly, my friend sent me a very old video of Whoopi Goldberg mm. during that whole fiasco. She was doing 
a a stand up. Uh, she was doing her stand up routine, which was she would do characters. She did mm. these really creative characters, and she did this character of a junkie from from America who somehow ends up on a plane um, and goes to Auschwitz or, or or visits the Anne Frank Museum. Rather, it's like this black American junkie somehow ends up on a plane through this crazy series of events, ends up in the Anne Frank Museum and ends up having this sort of profound moment of empathy with, with the memory of Anne Frank that sort of cuts her out of her constant junkie sort of psycho thought. She has this kind of moment of clarity of seeing that her and Anne Frank are kind of the same. And that was an interesting... I mean, that was an interesting thing to see because there is a version of Whoopi's comments that that were really just, you know, an attempt to say something maybe deep about how superficial all of these differences are. Where she said the Holocaust is about man's inhumanity to man. Like that could seem like she's just denying the racism of it all and in some way diminishing the moral crime of the Holocaust. Or it might have been akin to her like 20 minute sketch about a a black junkie empathizing with Anne Frank and seeing that they're the same. It could have been a a good faith reading is that she was really trying to make a point about fundamental human unity or something like that. I really don't know what is true. Yeah, it could be. I also just think to be honest that in America, we have a very specific conception of what it means to be raced. And in contemporary America, Whatever you think, this isn't me stating an opinion, because again, I'm not trying to go through this media cycle again, (laughs) but you know, we don't think in in contemporary 2022 America, if you think about how we, what we consider to be the quote unquote race on the census of prominent Jewish Americans, whether it's Jared Kushner or Barbara Streisand or Woody Allen, whoever you want to pick out of a hat, we would call them white. They would Mm -hmm. call themselves white. Mm-hmm. And I think that on some really basic level, Whoopi Goldberg is just not thinking of a kind of Jewish racial ethnic identity in that way. And so when someone said, you know, um, anti-Semitism or what, I forget the context. Oh, they were talking about mouse. Uh, when someone said the Holocaust was about race, racism, I think Whoopi literally just was like, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it because in a, her contemporary you know, perception, Jews are white. So it's not racist. It's something else. It's bad. It's equally bad. It's prejudice. It's religious intolerance. It's ethnic intolerance, all of those things. But I just, I honestly think it's as simple as Whoopi Goldberg's conception of race is in a kind of contemporary American black, white binary. And that's just what happened. Yeah, that, that's actually what you said is exactly what I tweeted after that. That was my good faith interpretation of her, her, I, I don't even know that I would call it a mistake really. It was a, a layering of the modern definition of race on the right. past. Right. Um, but I, you know, like I said, I think maybe motivating the reaction to it was this underlying question of are Jews the oppressors or the oppressed? And y- yes, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, I, I uh, you know, if if one thing that Jewish Americans bring out is because no one except the crazy conspiracy people deny the long history of unique Jewish oppression, uh, it becomes a phenomenon to be explained why Jews are so successful as a minority in in America, right? It's like, if they've been oppressed for so long, why aren't they poor? And the conspiracy theorists answer this with, you know, like the the tinfoil hat crowd answers this with with their stuff, um, the anti-Semitic conspiracies about controlling the media and controlling everything. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I, I think, you know, the, the left-wing scholars or, or the liberal scholars don't have a, a ready answer to this because of how taboo it is to cite cultural factors uh, behind success, right? Like the, the history of— I don't, I don't know that you have to, right? I don't know that you have to. I mean, I'm not the immigration scholar, and so there's many people who have written about this, and they can be a lot more specific— But what's so fascinating to me about America as a country where everyone except for black American descendants of slavery and um, Native Americans immigrated here is that there are to date 
extreme differences, even among white immigrant groups in terms of their economic status that are explained by the status of the immigrant group when they came to the country. So to date, like Irish Americans fare worse off than Anglo Saxons economically in this country. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And depending on whether or not different, different, you know, East Asian immigrants, depending on whether or not they were, they came through an immigration wave of kind of elites from their country to the United States, you know, um, or, you know, kind of wealthier Cubans that were, you know, permitted immigration that still fare better than other kinds of Latinos. I mean, it's who comes over. And if a bunch of, you know, doctors and lawyers and, and, and educated people come over, if we opened the, you know, immigration doors to, you know, scientists and academics and people who are fleeing the Holocaust differentially based on kind of economics and status and the people who were able to leave or those who were more financially viable, then those things have trickle effects through time that you can see not just with Jewish people, but every immigrant population that's come to the country. Basically, the status you had is a status that you largely man- maintain so I would, um, economically. I, so yeah. My, my reading of the history of immigration is different than that. It's I think the Jews who came here in the 19th century and early, early 20th century were poor when they got here. They had, uh, you know, they, they were like, like low level merchants and like, you know, just like they, they, they did not come here being doctors and lawyers hey, but already. A merchant. And, 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 and then they were. No, I'm a, but they were poor. They were poor. But come on, a they merchant is a very different thing than like an Irish potato farming peasant. Do you know what I mean? It, it's not I to mean, say that you you were like many an elite. Were, but many of them were fleeing pogroms in in, in Eastern oh, abs- Europe. Where absolutely. They, they had everything taken from them and they came here with nothing. Absolutely. And then, but, and then two, you know, two decades later, the Ivy Leagues are trying to keep them out because they're sure, scoring but, too high on, on the test. And I think absolutely. that, you know, you, you have to have some account of of culture, of the internal culture of a group Coleman, that, that's you, been like a thousand years studying the Talmud and, and such. If, if right? you take everything away from me and throw me into a low income black neighborhood without a dollar in my bank account, that doesn't make me equal to the per, the black person there who's had none of the educational experiences, the professional experiences, the ability to move through the world that I've accrued by this age. So th- this is not about d- yeah. diminishing the trials that but, but all I of these immigrant groups have. I would call that culture what you just, what you I just wouldn't call that culture. To. I don't think that my, my very like individualized life experiences are cultural. It's just, I'm Brianna Gray and I've had this life and I've had this, these privileges and I've had these experiences. But it's not because it, I'm black. It's not because I'm part of a network. It's because it's class. It's my, it's my class background that has given me intent, you know, intangible benefits that will stay with me regardless of what happens to me economically. Yeah. I, th- I really think you're naming culture in my mind. It's like, well, like how does, how do cultures get made to begin with? It's just the patterns of what people do and what people know and the intangible benefits, as you're saying, that you carry with you from what your parents gave you, your community and your habit patterns. But it's, right? it's not, it's, like it's not my parents that. and my community, right? Because, you know, my grandmother and I are very differently situated. And I think that she's very much a member of my community and instrumental to my life. But her being stripped of all her resources, even if she were, let's say, my same age, and me being stripped of all my resources totally, do you, not put us in the same situation. No, no. But I agree with that. I mean, I'm so culturally different from my my grandparents, right? Like my my. <laughs> On my mother's side, my grandma has a third grade education, speaks, speak no English, you know, like her culture and my culture, even though I visited her all the time, were just totally, totally different because I was raised in a, you know, getting read to all the time, highly literate household, um, expect almost everyone I knew as a kid went to college. So the notion that I wouldn't go to college was unthinkable. That's culture. Whereas my grandma didn't know a single person that went to college. College, I'm not even know she understood the concept of college. And it was a shock that when one of her daughters went to college, that's culture too. And it's nobody's fault. It's a matter of your background and where you're from. But, you know, the way cultures evolve have a huge impact on the relative success uh, of different groups. I guess my question is what is gained by calling it culture? Because, you know, if, you, if it were neutral and it's just a word, we could call it 
potato as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. But or I guess my resistance, the, uh, yeah, yeah my, my, I guess my resistance is because so often the idea that a differences between groups are cultural is understood as it's intrinsic. And if we're talking about me having a different culture than my mom and my grandmother and everybody else, even though we're all part of the same very intimate community with each other, and it changes rapidly, not just between generations, but between one decade of my life to the next, frankly, then I, I am worried about the way that that term can be exploited to justify not doing the things that can quote unquote change culture. If, if culture is me going to college and having this experience of going to college and having the experience of getting good jobs because I went to a school where they, you know, all these firms competed heavily. Then when we're having these kind of conservative conversations about how we have to improve the culture of these deficient groups, well then, okay, fine. We're just talking about improving public education and make college, making college free and canceling student debt. Then we're all on the same page, but we know that's not the conversation that's actually being had. So this notion that you know, I, I don't know who thinks this, but I, I do think you're right that someone, some people out there think this, that culture is 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 intrinsic. That is the opposite of what culture is in, in my mind. And in the, in the history of ideas, the anthropologists like like Franz Boas and, and folks like that in the early 20th century who came up with cultural theories of why countries, uh, ethnic groups and races differ – they were doing that in order to argue back against the people that said it's all genetics, right? There are people that are saying that all, you know, this is during the popularity of eugenics when people were saying, oh, the Anglo-Saxons are different from the Greeks or different from the Jews because I don't know why I'm doing a Southern accent. It was like everyone was, <laughs> everyone was a eugenicist back then. And they were saying it's all genes. It's intrinsic. It can't change. And then the anthropologists came along and they said, no, actually it can change. It changes all the time. It's called culture. And so when I say it's culture, I, I mean precisely to imply that it, it not only can it change, it will change no matter what. It's always changing, but it's a matter of which direction you push the changes in. Well, I guess my, here, here's my hesitation. It's not just that it's perceived as intrinsic, but that it's somehow willful, like a product of individual will. So if we sit here and agree, okay, the problem with black people is black culture is deficient. Mm -hmm. Don't nobody clip this out of context. This is a hypothetical. If we were to hypothetically agree, okay, the issue is black culture is deficient. What does that mean next? Because the people who make those kinds of claims are never saying, okay, well, the culture is not going to college. You're not having people, enough people in the community that have gone to college that it becomes a matter of course, the way it was for, for you and I. Okay. Well, the answer isn't to say, okay, let's make sure that everybody in this community has an opportunity to go to college. There's a presumption that what cu the culture means when people talk about that with respect to black people, it's that this idea that black people don't quote unquote value education. Black people don't want to go to school. Black people are making fun of other black people for being smart in school and all of this kind of rhetoric, which is used to justify not investing more in those communities. Right. Mm -hmm. When to my experience, and I talked about this with professor Lowry couldn't be farther from the truth. Every black person I know has more debt than white people. I mean, black, black women have more student debt than anybody else because of this perverse way that we're trying to prove that we aren't deficient in the way that society tells us to. So every, all these black women are running around with these master's degrees that frankly aren't even worth very much. They don't in, increase their um, earning potential, but because society has been telling them for decades now that everything wrong with black people is this cultural lack of value for education. So we're disproportionately degreed we are disproportionately indebted, but we all know that that's, but we're still kind of fighting against these tropes that somehow the reason that there's the, these economic gaps between black people and white people is because we don't care enough. And I think that's, that's kind of pernicious. So if, if it is, if it is culture, if I agree with you that it's culture, what's the next step? How do you go about changing the culture as opposed to just lambasting people for having a culture that you perceive to be insufficient? That's a great question. So I think the the truth about changing culture is that a it's incredibly difficult b it's it's almost you know it's very nearly impossible for the government to do in a in a top down way and when it does happen it happens because people try to make local changes in their own communities 
face to face with people they know um, through whether it be through church or through a school. Um, and, you know, ultimately it's like you have the most control sort of over the culture of your household, of your family. It's like the culture imparted to me by my mother um, was one of a very high expectations. It's like my mom expected me to get an A. She was a quote unquote tiger mom, even though she was Puerto Rican. Right. And to, to a higher extent, even than many white kids in my, in my town, you know, like they, their parent, many, many parents that were content for their kids to get B's and sort of say they were doing okay. So the question is, if we're going to obsess over group wide statistics, right. You have to look at group wide behaviors or else it, it, it's meaningless. Right. So what's the group wide so, behavior? Because my mom wasn't a tire mom at all. I was, you know, supported in my intellectual curiosity was fed. I was read to a great deal. We went to a lot of museums at mm-hmm. no point in my life. Was I ever, it was, was it ever indicated that there was an expectation that I go to an Ivy league school college? Mm-hmm. Of course, but absolutely not. I was never criticized for getting a B. I was mm-hmm. never, you know, pushed to get an A like, and so do, but do, do, you, <laughs> do you think that parental expectations of that kind matter? I think kids are different and some people are harangued but, but, and don't know, but, perform. But some people aren't harangued. I, I obviously I agree with that, but did everything else held equal for the average kid. Do you think it matters? Do you think it makes a difference to have um, parents that really expect you to get A's as opposed to parents that are happy for you to get C's? No, I think that when we're talking about wealth disparities, given how many white people get C's and they're still okay. Um, that the issue isn't these kind of parental nuances. It's whether or not people can, people don't go to college because they can't afford to go to college for the most part. Now there's a bigger conversation to be had about the value of trade schools, how many good jobs come from learning a trade, how as a society, there's been this neoliberal push to make, to, to blame economic disparity, regardless of race on people's failure to get an education. And that's been a big neoliberal lie. Um, and that it's really about, job markets and jobs being, um, job markets narrowing because of, uh, exporting jobs overseas and the declining manufacturing sector and corporate greed and all other kinds of things. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a bigger conversation to be had. But if the goal is, if you, if you want to know why one member of my family went to college and one didn't, it's not because their parent did or did not care about education more than the other. It's often people, siblings in the same family. It has to do with, being able to afford education. A lot of people drop out. My mom had to take an extra semester to graduate from college because she couldn't come up with $400 one year for her tuition. And that would have derailed certain other people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It it comes down to people feeling like they don't have to rush and get in a job market because they have to take care of their families. It has sometimes people get derailed for all kinds of other personal issues. And I would say, if you want to have people going to college, if that's a value that we have as as a society, which you know, it was a conversation to be had again. But if we do want everyone to go to college and we think that that will close the racial wealth gap, again, dubious, but okay. Yeah, well, then let's, too, let's, too. let's, let's look at what happened with um, uh, high school education attainment. We did not used to have a public uh, education system. We got one uh, in the mid of, middle of last century and we suddenly went from very few people having high school degrees to everybody having a high school degree because it was free. And that was the cultural expectation. If we want full college um, attendance, then make public colleges and universities free and people will go just like they've gone K through 12 or go to a trade school as an alternative and have those options be free as well. Cause a lot of student debt, I really want to make this fine point because it gets breezed over. A lot of student debt comes from people going to trade schools and also associates programs. It's not just this elite thing. So you're right? not, how, um, I've been pretty compelled by people who say we need to have more of a culture of trade schools in America, like they do in some European countries. Like there, mm-hmm. there are some European countries where it's just, it's, it's way more normal to, mm-hmm. to go to a trade school and just to know you're, you're the kind of person that's going to do better at trade school. Whereas here we have, we've identified going to a four year college as this sort of golden pill that's going to cure right. everything when it's not the right solution for a lot of people. Correct. Correct. And there's a lot, I I mean, I alluded to this, but this is, this is a big deal. 
we were talking about the ways in which identity politics, you know, both parties basically divest from substantive class politics. What liberals did, part of what liberals did was to say, okay, we're supposed to care about black people. That's our, that's our cohort. Okay. We're supposed to care about Latinos. We're supposed to care about all the diverse people. All right. Okay. So we got to say something that addresses all of this disparity, all of the crap that's going on in the nineties, the drug war, all of this stuff. We got to say something, right? Okay. So what we're going to say is that the reason all of this stuff exists is because y'all didn't go to college. That has been the prevailing narrative forever. Uh, Instead of asking our elected officials to actually deal with the mess that they made with deindustrializing the workforce and getting rid of low wage labor and and the the fact of automation, meaning that some jobs are just not going to come back and saying, okay, well, because we believe in the value of human beings, we're going to create a social safety net that exists in places like Scandinavia where everyone has a decent ability to live, right? The fact that we innovated and built robots means that, Hey, we don't have to do as much work and this should be a good thing. That's the Jetsons future. We were all supposed to be aiming for instead of moralizing and saying, you don't deserve to live in a house unless you're laboring for 40 hours a week, (laughs) which is the world we live in now. Instead they said, okay, no, we're going to blame it all on, we're going to blame it all on people's individual ability to get an education or desire to get an education or ability to get an education. And so to take the, to distract you from the extent to which they are, these are policy choices that are being made at a very high level so that very wealthy people can benefit themselves. Right. And so now we've had many, many, many decades of this kind of cultivated elitism that comes from not people wanting to say, I'm better, I'm better than an electrician, I'm better than a plumber, but because the, the message from on high, from all of the people who everyone loves, the Obamas and everyone has been education is it, education is it. And liberals love a technocracy. They love a technocrat. They love a Barack Obama. They love an Elizabeth Warren who says, I'm very smart and I went to the right schools and therefore I know how to solve all the world's problems. As though poverty exists because someone just hasn't thought it through with their McKinsey brain hard enough. No, <laughs> these are policy choices that are being made by people who very much benefit benefit from poverty existing, right? Who very much benefit from there being an excess labor market. As we've seen now during COVID, where all of these corporations are all like crying boo boo hoo hoo because their people were empowered enough to actually demand a living wage. When we haven't had a minimum wage raise for the longest period in American history since the minimum wage was invented in 1938. That's where we are. And yet we have all of these like Bloomberg media articles saying, oh, it's, it's a disaster that, that workers have enough power and leverage because of the stimulus checks to actually demand the wages they should have been getting for a long time if we had uh, inflation adjusted wages. So that's all to say, I agree with you that we are in this problem with this kind of elite education being the be all and all solve that it isn't. Mm-hmm. But it's not because of just a random left-wing elitism, like some people will argue. It's because that is the messaging that has been used to cover for the disastrous economic policies that both corporate parties have been pursuing for the last 30 years. And then there's obviously nothing wrong with college. I I personally believe everyone should have the right to go to college because we benefit from a well-educated workforce We don't need people to labor as much because of automation as we used to. And I think it's a wonderful time to be spending in your life, educating the public, getting to know people who are different from you, having a sense of national solidarity, getting to know your fellow man. I think college is a wonderful experience and we can afford for everyone to do it. And we Mm -hmm. should have that ability for everyone if they want it. But I also don't think that we should believe like buy into the notion that that is the dividing line between the rich and the poor. Cause I'm telling you these Walton kids and these, you know, Biden kids and all of these elite kids who are running around being very public fail sons mm-hmm. are not some elite savants who deserved to get into Wharton and all the schools that their parents have paid for them to get into. And it's not a meritocracy. It's just not. So you mentioned the minimum wage. And, and so I'm going to channel my friend who, owns, um, owns a business in New York city. He owns a restaurant and a comedy club. And he says, you know, he tells me, you know, it it makes me so angry when people just blithely talk about a minimum wage increase, because what that is, is a law that I have to pay other people more and look at my balance sheet, which is very narrow, you know, narrow profit margins, highly competitive industry. And they're telling me I have to pay more to each employee, which means practically I need to fire someone. And why not just have a wage subsidy? If the government is just, why can't, why can't the government use taxpayer money to, to directly pay my workers 
$1 extra for every $15 I pay them so that it doesn't come out of my pocket? Well, I support a number of wage subsidies, one of which is called Medicare for All. Since your small business owner friend will tell you that the number one expense for most business owners is health care. I'm a small business owner. You know, I have exactly one employee at my podcast, right? And I can vouch for the fact that healthcare is the biggest expense by far. So instead of all of me paying my contribution to my healthcare, the employer paying the other half of the contribution of the employee's money to healthcare, we all know that that same amount of money, less going straight to the government for an administered healthcare plan that doesn't I go through the middleman of these insurance industries who have an enormous bureaucracy that is designed not to help you get better or to get care, but to come up with ways to deny you treatment when you're at one of the hardest moments in your life. You know, that's a, that's a good way to have a subsidy. Another one is to talk about a jobs program, which is something on the left's agenda, a guaranteed jobs, a job guarantee mm-hmm. so that we, we have a place. If you're, if you know, if you can't pay equitable wages. Okay. Well, you're, you're the person you want to employ should also have the opportunity to go and work somewhere where they can earn a $15 minimum wage. One thing I will give Joe Joe Biden credit for is that all federal employees now at least have a $15 uh, minimum wage and and contractors have a $15 minimum wage. So maybe your friend isn't able to pay your, his, his or her employees a living wage. Okay. I don't think that means that employee deserves to be exploited. I think that means that they should be able to find a job on the job market that will pay them that. And if that means that you're no, an mean, employee, he, he pays them a living wage. You know, he pays them what what waiters and and get paid in, in the, Greenwich the Village. The Coleman, you know? that's not a living wage. And I don't mean this. This isn't your friend. I'm not saying your friend's a, a bad person. But the reality is, before we had a minimum wage, we also didn't have child labor laws. We also didn't have forty dollars. Uh, forty dollars. 40 hour week. We had all of these in, um, innovations around the new deal because we were living in a hellscape where we were sending nine year olds down chimneys and they were dying at 25 of the black lung. We had no workplace protections. We had no nothing. So unless the argument is, I just don't believe in the minimum wage and we should just have a libertarian hellscape. I mean, no, no, God the, bless the you. The argument <laughs> is, is a uh, minimum wage versus, versus wage sub- subsidy. One okay. forces me as a business owner to, bear the cost of you want to make the world a better place, but you're ordering me to, to, to allocate money in my business differently. And you're forcing me essentially to fire someone in many cases, um, because you think you're making the world a better place as opposed to direct a a wage subsidy, which does the same thing, but puts the responsibility on the government. Well, Coleman, let me ask you this hypothetical. If I'm able to run my business, if I'm able to find someone who's willing to edit my podcast for a dollar an hour. Let's say they're willing to do that because they're a non-documented immigrant who isn't able to get a job over the table. Let's say it's because they are under immense financial pressure um, because they have a student loan debt or some other kind of debt that's come due um, and they're facing eviction and they have a family or they have medical bills. Let's say whatever constraints they're under, they're willing to do it for an exploitative price when market is at least, let's say $50 an hour for the same, for that job. For a non-immigrant. For, yeah. Say. For someone who had the ability to get a different, you know, to go elsewhere, to, to shop on the marketplace and, and, and get, take their, their labor elsewhere. I would argue that the only way I get that person to work for me below market value is because the, the system itself is broken, right? The, the, and this is, this is where I think your mom was right about Marx. I'm sorry. I'm not like, sure I'd, I totally understand the hypothetical because, you know, if, it, if, if it's an immigrant working for you at a low wage, but it's below market, it's below market for maybe what a, a, a native worker would demand, but it's, it's market for, for immigrant labor no, in the it's, industry. The market is artificially created by constraints of a system that we designed. These things aren't natural law. The reality is we, so I don't want to know that if I want to get into this whole like profit is, is wage theft right now, since we're kind of probably nearing the end of our, our time together. <laughs> but the, the reality is if I'm able to exploit somebody because they don't have options, if I take that ability to I, win. I, wor- I worry you're preloading the, the argument by describing it as exploitation rather than employment. Well, this is why we have to do labor profit is wage, wage theft. Yeah. This is why we have to do that. That's why we always have to do that dance. And I know that, look, I am not some great Mark scholar. I don't know that I've, I've 
I've read Marx outside of the context of some like sophomore college class. You know, I'm not that person. He's really hard to read. Yeah, I mean, and, I'm and looking very, over at my bookshelf because there's many unclear. unopened books over there. There's many books that I got like three clearly. words in. But but here's the basic here's the basic gist as I understand it. I'm sorry, all the Marxist scholars who I'm sure are going to tell me that I've oversimplified this. But if I am a business owner and I build my business's tables, the reason I'm a business owner, I come to this with capital. I have the capital to buy the wood that is going to go into the tables, right? That's how I'm the business owner. How I got the capital, it's an interesting question. No one ever goes back that far. And that's a really important conversation to have. But I have capital. I it, Let's say it takes $5 of wood for me to build every table. And once the table is built, I can sell it for $10. Okay. That means that that's $5 of profit. Somebody built that table, right? And the person who built that table through their labor turned a $5 pile of wood into a $10 table, right? It's worth $10 only because of their labor turned that $5 wood into a $10 table. Without them, I still just have a $5 pile of wood, right? Yeah. This is the labor theory of value, right? Correct. So for me to profit and the whole, the whole reason I'm, I'm in this, right. Is because I want to profit for me to profit. I have to take some portion of that $5 and that's, that is what one would might call ex- exploitation because in a world where the laborer happened to have the $5 for the wood to begin with, they would be able to completely recoup the benefits of their labor. So managers, and, and, all managers and owners could be erased from the earth and the production would stay the same. No, the issue is whether or not the people who are able to front capital should be the ones that are deciding who gets what cut of the labor, as opposed to these other models that the left talks about, like employee ownership, where there are more collaborative decisions being made that aren't based on who just happened to come in with a capital to begin with, right? Because mm-hmm. the reason that we have all of these jobs that got offshored, for instance, is because what's good for the own corporate owner at the top in terms of marginally increasing profit by one cent by making a Malaysian child build your sneakers or whatever is not what the decision making would be of the laborer in Detroit who doesn't really care about making one more cent profit on their dividend. They care about the shop staying local, their ability to drive to work, their ability to keep their job and keep their community intact. And we have these perverse incentives that are happening all over the place because we have a system that is able to be dictated by the owners of capital who I got to say often came to that capital in dishonest ways that are, have nothing to do with their home own work or ingenuity. It's inheritance, it's legacies of slavery or colonialism or exploitation. And I know I'm losing people now saying these words, but it, it, it is just a historical reality of the situation. People weren't just, bestowed with random amounts of money, according to merit upon birth. I, I wish that's the way the world was, but so it's not. What is your model? Uh, is, is there a company you can point to that's, that's doing it this way that you think is doing a great job that other companies should. Yeah. Emulate? So employee ownership is a huge thing. And I, I would recommend you maybe have, if you haven't already professor Richard Wolf on the program, um, I would be happy to put you in touch and he would be a do much better job at this than I am. He's a Marxist mm-hmm. economist, mm-hmm. um, and a really wonderful speaker. Um, but, uh, Costco, for instance, is an example of an employer ownership model where these kinds of uh, distribution decisions are being made by a collective. Uh, the, so I think the that's Packers, like I, I, Costco has always been touted as having like a great worker culture, and so forth. But I'm also, is it, is it the, the democratic socialist end goal to see, you know, Walmart and Amazon just all looking like Costco? Would that be the, the, well. like the ball in the net? Or uh, my, my suspicion is there would be some still very deep and fundamental critiques of even that system, right? Well, no, I mean, I think the idea would be if, if business decisions were being made by an employee owned model Mm -hmm. that many, if not all of the um, vagaries of companies like Amazon would cease to exist Mm -hmm. because the people who are designing how the company works Mm -hmm. would be changing them. So I was just, I think it was on a recent episode of my podcast, but it might've been somewhere else. I was listening to this that was breaking down. I know it was, I was talking to Matt Brunig on on Mm -hmm. my show this week. Um, And we were talking about nationalizing, nationalizing the oil industry and some of these other industries that have had to have government bailouts um, where the government basically has owned majority stakes and things like GM and then just quietly return them to private ownership 
when they didn't have to, right? Like it bought it fair and square. And there's a question as to whether or not the government would be a bit, do a better job administering it than the companies that got themselves into these troubles to begin with. And as we're talking about rising oil prices and um, environmental harms and all these other kinds of things, whether or not the government should step in and stop subsidizing the oil industry, just buy it and then help a green transition and wind down in a way that doesn't disadvantage the workers in those industries. Okay. So that's the topic of the conversation. And in that context, Matt Brunick, who's this policy wonk um, from this people's policy think tank, which does amazing work, uh, was talking about various companies where the profit margin like per person is really extraordinarily large. So there is this idea among some that if you were to distribute all the, all the profits that it actually wouldn't be enough to go around and you couldn't actually pay everybody a $15 minimum wage and all of that. But he was pointing to these examples where it is absolutely true. And that the employees would be making very different decisions. Another example of this is Dan Price who became famous and is now kind of like a social media celebrity because he decided he looked around at his own business and was confronted by an employee in the parking lot one day, thought he was a good guy. And the employee was basically mad at him for not paying him enough. And it sent him into a kind of an existential tizzy. And he said, fine, I'm going to cut my salary and we're all just going to make $70,000 a year. Everybody in the company, no matter what they do, I'm, I'm getting rid of my million dollar salary or whatever it was. And we're all going to earn $70,000 a year. And what he discovered is that profits went up, his retention went up, his employees were happier, everybody worked harder. And it's like a real feel good story of the year. And like, nobody follows his example, right? Like he makes more money now, but nobody follows his example. So again, I, I'm speaking in a, in a vague way that is undermining the validity of the case that could be made by someone like Richard Wolf. Um, but that I, I, I just am really, I want, want, want to challenge listeners to consider the fact that so much of what we accept about how the world is, we treat like it's natural law as though this wasn't a country that didn't exist 300 years ago and that we didn't design very purposefully. And that capitalism is a system that only came into existence relatively recently post-feudalism and feudalism only existed relatively recently in the whole history of human humanity. And given that all we have achieved and as great a minds that have come out of this country, I challenge us to continue to think and try to do better and not waste our time comparing ourselves to other places in the world and sitting on our laurels and saying, well, we've done good enough. Okay. So I'm going to leave it there. There's, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that opens a whole can of worms that I think we'll have to get into again some other time. We'll have to and come I, on bad I'm, faith and we can get into it. Yes. I'm really eager to. Um, but, but for now, this has been a really great conversation, Brianna. And before I let you go, I just want to point my listeners in your direction. You have the Bad Faith Podcast, right? That's right. That's and what we put out. Two episodes a week, a free episode on Thursdays. And you can also watch full video episodes at Bad Faith YouTube. Or for $5 a month, you can get an extra premium episode every Monday at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's awesome. Okay. I'm awaiting my invitation. <laughs> it's coming. It's, you're getting it right now. Let's All set right. up some time for next week. Cool. All right, Brianna. All right. Take care. Talk soon. Bye-bye. If you appreciate the work I do, the best ways to support me are to subscribe directly through my website, colemanhughes.org, and to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you'll never miss my new content. As always, thanks for your support.